Okay, guys, welcome back to the show. And today I've got a very, very special guest on the show, a man I've been talking to for quite a while to try and get this thing wrapped up. It's He's an actor and he's soon to be making his directorial debut. It's Mr. Douglas Tate. How are you doing, man? What's up, man? I actually made the directorial debut. The movie's finished, coming out this uh, this year. So Yeah. That's what that's kind of what I meant, but uh, it hasn't come out oh, yet. Okay. People are going to be able to see Angel Baby soon, and that's that's where we'll start today. So, gotcha. do you want to give us a bit of a background on on that project and how long you were working on it, and what's the kind of plot with it? Yeah, we uh, we started it uh, in 2021 and shot it, um, but I had been working on it for a uh, time before that, and uh, um, you know, it was my first time doing a feature, but I had done shorts and directed a TV pilot. Um, and it's been something I've wanted to do for years, but it's just a lot to put together and to get funding, but finally made it happen. And, um, uh, we just sent over the rest of the deliverables, which is like the post-production stuff you need for all the streaming sites last week. So finally, um, hardest thing I've ever done, but most rewarding. I uh, went to Con Film Festival and it was being pitched there for uh, foreign sales. So it'll definitely come to Ireland and, and the European market at some point. I know in North America it will come out this year. So hopefully foreign too, but I don't know. We'll see. It's yeah, called Angel Me, by the way. Yeah. Is it going to come to theaters or is this something that's going to go straight to the streaming sites? Do you think? No, we, we talked about that, but because of the way the film market is, it's very difficult for an indie film to get theatrical distribution. You know, it takes a big budget behind it. And, and since we're not a studio, the studio films uh, cover that market. Um, so it's going to be streaming, but it'll be available on a lot of different streaming sites. So. Uh, I just don't know which ones yet, but most of the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. And can yeah. you give us an idea of kind of the plot and what the movie is about? It's basically a um, about a family that loses uh, their stillborn baby and um, decide to get away to heal. And they move to this mountain town, this cabin. And the cabin has a dark past, a very dark past, which... Okay. We come to find out the twists and turns. So it's more of a thriller than a horror, but it does have some horror in it. I play the villain in it also, which helped. I didn't have to cast somebody for that. I was already there. So, <laughs> but uh, it's exciting. It's very exciting to have it out there finally after all this time. Yeah, excellent. I uh, wish you the, the best of luck with it anyway. I'll be keeping an eye out for it over here for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. If we if we rewind back then from current to the start how did you decide that you know you wanted to get into this kind of tv movie kind of world well i um i as a kid i was uh making my own like short horror movies and films on vhs back then it was uh it was the 80s so we had vhs this huge bulky camera you know um and put a vhs to sh shoot it and then i was trying to edit it on vhs cameras so even though I didn't know I was filmmaking, I was like, I was doing it on my own because I was interested in it. Um, and then um, when I was about 12 years old, I went to Universal Studios Hollywood for a friend's birthday party and I saw Frankenstein performing and I was blown away because he was scaring people. He was making people laugh and I was tall at the time too. So I'm like, when I turn eight, 16, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to get that job. And I did. I went there when I was 16, got the job as Frankenstein, then started playing like the Wolfman, all the classic Universal monsters, Phantom, um, the Mummy, um, and then um, did a bunch of shows and, and other characters while I was there. Harry's one of them. And then um, from that, I just started uh, pursuing acting once I graduated high school. So that was like my training ground. I worked there for 10 years. Um, up until the point when I got Freddy vs. Jason is when I said, okay, it's time. It's time to, to quit this job. But that was like a good little performing training ground where I was getting paid. And it's really the only other job I've had since, uh, since I started acting. Yeah. Did, did getting that role in Freddy vs. Jason change a lot of things for you? Were you surprised by how massive that the whole thing was and people are like so familiar with you from it? 
Yeah, I mean, I, at, at first it really didn't change much, but it it did in my mind say, hey, this is like, I finally am working on something big. You know, like before I did little indie films and stuff, small parts on TV shows. And then then when I got that, I said, you know, this is a like a this is a well-known franchise. Um, and um, it opened some doors for more projects, indie, but it didn't really change, you know, where I was getting hired on big stuff all the time. But it, it did help. It did help open the door where people are like, oh, he was in this movie. Cool. Let's uh, let's get him in on our indie movie. Um, so it was a good it was a good, um, you know, talking point, but it didn't really move the needle that much at that time. Yeah. yeah. And you were saying I've heard the story before, but I suppose we'll have to say about how yeah. you ended up, how you ended up uh, in that role. Yeah. So so I, I had I got the audition for it. Um, and I was like, this is, oh my God, I can do this. I got, they, they wanted somebody, my height, my bill, you know? And, uh, uh, so it was, uh, it was, I was perfect for it. And then when I went in, you know, I was working at Universal Studios, so I was already playing these characters in mass and I knew the Jason character. So I went in and did it. Um, the director, Kane was originally supposed to do the character. He was already offered it. That's what I found out from Kane Hodder who played, you know, Jason and four other yeah. Uh, Friday the 13th, those who don't know. Um, and then um, what happened was the director came in when they hired him. He didn't want Kane. He wanted somebody taller, which totally sucks because, you know, you're offered something that you've already done four times. So because of the, he wanted that, that height over Robert England, you know, to look more like, you know, when they're fighting, there's that height difference. Mm -hmm. So I had auditioned for it. They called me back went in again, did it. And then they like put a pin on me. They put me on like a hold because they, they were checking my dates, considering me. And then a month goes by and I don't hear anything. And my agent reached out and then they said, Oh, you didn't get it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this sucks. And then from meeting Ken, um, we talked about it and he said, yeah, I was going in to meet Ronnie you for the stunt coordinator job. And me and Ronnie, you hit it off. And me and Ken are the same height, same build at the time, 6'5". And he said, why don't you play Jason? You're perfect. They were shooting in Canada. I'm from LA. What happened was, is when they screened the movie after it was finished, Ken, uh, not Ken, the, the audience did not like the ending. Basically the ending, Jason Ritter grows claws in bed with Monica Kina. And uh, it's in the deleted scenes. And um, they were like, I don't get it. I don't get it. So they said, we're going to reshoot the ending. They shot it in LA. They couldn't get Ken's visa in time. So they already had me as a second choice. And that's how it all, it all happened. So unfortunately, I didn't get to do the whole movie, but I did get to end the movie. And what's cool now doing the convention circuit is we have a totally different mask, a different um jason outfit mine's battle damage mask his is more clean my outfit's a little more torn because it's the ending in the water and i also am holding freddie's head which you know it's a special little thing so it separates our our characters for the photo off thing with conventions and stuff yeah, yeah. yeah. so you, you you've left the door open the last thing we've seen is you coming out of the water for that that sequel we may never get but maybe someday know. you never know you never know. Unfortunately, when I was doing it, Robert England had said that this is the last time I'm playing this character. I can't, I can't do this again. You know? Yeah. So yeah. it's just not the same without him. You could put another guy in a hockey mask, but you can't have Freddie without Robert England. Yeah. That's, that's a fact. Yeah. Especially because yeah. he's a talking character as well. Exactly. And um, I know from listening to uh, previous podcasts of yours that you were a big Halloween fan. Yes. Not only of the not only of the movie, but of just Halloween in general. Oh yeah. And then and then you, yeah. you, you end up as the shape in Halloween kills. Um what's that like for you from the young man growing up? And I think you said your favorite movie was Halloween two, I think growing up. Yes. And yeah. then you're here and you're in the franchise. What was that like for you kind of on a personal level? It was pretty surreal. It gave me the chills. Uh, I remember shooting a video, which I, I have on my channels. Uh, 
of I've getting, seen it earlier. Yeah. I've seen it earlier. And I've yeah. seen how excited that you were to put Dude, on that. I, that was real, man. That was not, I was not acting. I was like literally getting the chills doing that because when you, when you like something and see something as a child, I found that it has a special place and then getting to be a part of that same thing that you saw as a child on the real deal thing, not a costume for Halloween is just absolutely surreal. Uh, I had that moment working with Robert England, like, cause I grew up watching him. So that was another surreal moment, but, um, it was, it was unbelievable. Cause when I, my first horror movie I ever saw was Halloween too. It was left inside a VHS player that, we bought our first VHS player it was uh, apparently returned from, to the store. We bought it and that was in the tape and it, I didn't know what it was. I just thought, Oh, cool. A Halloween movie. I love Halloween. And then that's how I got my first introduction to actually Halloween. So when I first got in the coveralls, like we just mentioned, I was like, this is insane. And then I put the mask when they put the mask on me the first time, Chris Nelson, and then I was out in the Midwest with the lights and the Halloween vibe. And it was shooting like, I think we shot in October. So we were like, it was late September, or October. So it had the weather feel, it had the trees. It was just amazing. I mean, uh, I, I can't describe it. It was like being a kid, but yet here I am doing it, you know? It was really cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, in, in terms of, we'll, we'll talk about acting for a minute. In terms of acting, do you prefer acting in movies or do you prefer acting in TV shows? And which one would you prefer? Um, I'd have to say movies if I were to say, but there is a nice, it's a nice thing to have a regular gig, you know? And I feel like, on a TV series, if you have time with your character, you really can explore that character and it becomes part of you. Sometimes when you do something quick in a movie or whatever, you don't have the time to, to really get into it. Um, so it's a different process. TV is fast moving and it's like shoot it in a week and a half and it's out, you know, and then you move on. Movies are a little more drawn out. Um, but uh, I would say if I were to, if I were to choose what I could just, if I had a choice, it would be film. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't deny a series, a regular on a series. Um, yeah. Cause you had, you had a lot of regular, yeah. you had a lot of regular roles in, um, in Teen Wolf like as well. So that was one that lasted quite a while, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a good one. And then the last one I was a reg regular character was on Legacies, which uh, ended a year ago. Um, that was a spinoff of Vampire Diaries and the originals. I'm sure. I, I, I'm sure you. Yeah, you guys get that out in the UK and uh, yeah, Ireland. Yeah. So yeah, um, but uh, it's nice to come back and and you know have a job like that that's ongoing for sure in this business. It's a really really special thing. Yeah. What's What's your proudest moment of your career so far? It has to be uh, doing the movie that I, that we made, um, just cause it's so, uh, it was so much work to put together. Um, when you're an actor, you're just showing up on set and then here you are, you know, from start to finish and seeing it all through, it's just more rewarding. Uh, so it's definitely the film I made. Yeah. For sure. And in, yeah. In terms of the film that you made, obviously Angel Baby, have you got anything else in the pipelines that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, I have a film that I'm, I'm developing with my friend um, that we want to shoot in San Diego. It's called The Chauffeur, um, about the chauffeur driver. I would direct and play the main character, and it's it's definitely horror. It's a it's a it's an old school horror film. Um, and I feel like I want to give that to the fans that I've met along the way because they're craving for these indies like Terrifier is such a huge hit. Um, people are Crazy. going to for that. Um, so I want to give them something like that, you know, something that that uh, has that kind of feel to it. I mean, it's different, but, you know, um, 
it's got a lot of uh, cool stuff to it. I, I can't go into too much detail on it, but that's that's something sure. that I'm I got that I'm working on, and hopefully shoot that within the next year and direct it because um, I'm going to do more of that um, now that this is finished. So so yeah, for sure, want to do more. Yeah, and is is horror and thriller something that you're going to focus on and be your genre, or do you want to kind of branch out into different things? I would like to branch out, but I feel like at this time I can get the most out of that because um, I have people that follow me and that I meet on a consistent basis that that's, that's the stuff they crave. So I feel like it's, it's not only do I like doing those kind of films and I have fun doing them. I'm in that, that um, pool of, of people that are interested in seeing them. So it's like free promotion for me. Um, so I, I'm focusing on that at this point. And then eventually I could branch out maybe to other things, um, comedy and stuff like that. But I think you focus on what, what you have, uh, have that can, you can, you know, sell it. And, and I, I have connections to sell it with horror and thriller now. So, uh, I'm focusing on that at the moment and it's, and it's, and you could get it done without a star, you know, you can shoot, you can shoot these movies and you can make them and sell them and you don't need a movie star to sell them. There's other films. You can't do that. You, you know, like comedies and stuff without a name actor, you can't, you have a really hard time selling them. So, so yeah. In terms of the, the convention world, I know it's, it's big for you because of the, the two movies we touched on earlier more so as well, because of the, yeah. the size of those franchises. What yeah. was it like maybe getting that call to do your first convention and to where the convention world is now and how it's changed and got evolved into this massive thing? It's insane. Yeah. So, uh, Sean Clark, who is my signing agent, he's like one of the biggest in horror. He has his own channel, Horrors Hollow Ground, and um, a show with Chris Nelson, who did the effects for Halloween and also just did Exorcist he wrote me off facebook like a couple years after facebook started and said hey um i i'm a convention agent there's people that have wanted to meet you would you be interested in doing um a convention because i know you did the freddie versus jason and i was like really but i didn't do the whole movie and he's like no i know that i have ken is my client and i was like he's like but you could definitely do this because they want to get people behind the mask. And I just didn't understand that. I was like, really? Why? Why? Like, I'm not the main Jason. And then I realized now, obviously doing it, um, it's, uh, it's a whole nother world. And when I started, I felt like it was a very, um, it's, it was very focused on, you know, guys like me who've done like some things behind a mask and some, you know, some, some things that were, you know, classics, classic horror or whatever, you know, those were the guests you were seeing mostly. You weren't seeing big name people. And then now that's totally changed. Like you'll see famous people at shows right across from me that were on famous TV shows. And I mean, it's, it's like the amount of shows that have popped up now since then in, in the last 15 years is insane it's totally grown to this huge market where there's a show every weekend. I mean, you, I could be traveling every weekend um, if I chose to, to small shows, big shows, pop-up shows. It's crazy. Um, and uh, I'm, I did a show in UK like eight years ago and now I'm going back i'm going back to manchester so i'm even traveling the country for these things and i hear that show for the love of horror is just insane I hear it's amazing yeah, yeah I, I know i know a few people going over to it unfortunately i can't make it this year and oh, because, that's of, because of stuff i have got planned for for work and things but okay. uh, it's um it's the best it's the best horror convention in europe for sure anyway oh, i heard that oh yeah for sure yeah. yeah, I did the uh, UK, uh, the London Comic Con, and that's more um, spread out. A lot of the Doctor Who, they were the ones killing it at that show. Um, but yeah, since this is so focused on horror, like this is my this is my show in the in that market 
for me. This is the yeah. good one for, for me. Yeah. So, yeah. I just see a lot of you guys, in a, especially in the cons over in the States, to be lumped in with, say, a lot of horror guys here, and then there's a lot of wrestlers on this side. Of the yes. Bizarre. Yeah, it's well, funny how the wrestlers fit in with the horror. They, they, they yeah. kind of go hand in hand, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I I always say like the three things that I love: wrestling, horror, and rock music. They're all kind of interconnected. Like they are. I go now tomorrow night. I DJ up in a bar in Dublin. I do rock music. Oh no! Nights. And you see guys coming out with wrestling T-shirts or Jason T-shirts, and I feel like the community is all the one. Oh yeah, absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. And uh, there's some guys that now are putting on shows that are um, you know rock stars that are doing them like Ice Nine Kills put on their first show last year and it was huge and you know they play a concert at the show but all the fans they're horror fans of the you know they're horror fans so it, it mixes very well to the to the whole convention having having both of that yeah Corey taylor actually played at for the love of horror last year oh no like, way yeah. oh yeah oh wow yeah he's perfect i've seen him at shows too that's a yeah. perfect perfect one to have What's the strangest thing you've seen at a convention? <laughs> oh my God, I don't even think I could even say, but uh, man, the strangest thing. I mean, definitely some of the costumes, you know, I've seen, you know, guys in G strings with <laughs> demon horns and, uh, you know, like the craziest costumes. Uh, people get a little crazy in the evening with some some alcohol in them so i've seen some crazy stuff there some guy tackled me at a show and it was an actor um uh which that wasn't a good one but uh yeah the, it, these shows get kind of wild but in a fun way you know yeah the costumes are the craziest stuff though yeah. some of them are out there <laughs> I was I had Ginger Lynn. Do you know Ginger on the podcast? Yeah, she was in, yeah, uh, yeah. She was in Devil's Rejects and a few other projects. Let's just say that. And she told me yeah, that, uh, that she had to sign someone's oh, penis really? on one of these shows. <laughs> <laughs> she's a really nice lady. She's yeah, she's nice yeah, she's really 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 cool. Very very upfront and just oh, says yeah. what she thinks. You know, she's totally cool girl. Nice, for sure. Yeah, yeah. She's, she does be a couple of shows. Yeah. yeah, she just mixed into that world because I'm obviously working with Rob Zombie as well. So, perfect. Cool. Yeah, yeah. There was one. There was one thing on your IMDb page that I know a guy that's a massive Indiana Jones fan, and I've seen a credit for Indiana Jones: The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Just curious to know what you've done on that. So that was an interesting one. Um, so I was hired to. I some uh, somebody knew me and referred me. Um, because I had done a stunt acting role on a show and they needed a stunt double for the Russian character in that. And they called me in um, and uh, I matched the guy perfect. And I was like so excited because I was like, oh my God, this is like one of the big ones growing up, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Spielberg. And then they called me to rehearse one day yeah. And the rehearsal was doing these insane, which they never told me, this insane wire stuff where I was rigged 58, 58 feet up in the air, decelerated on a wire, slam on a platform while I'm holding Indiana Jones stunt double. And, and then we fight and then I fall off and then get plummeted down to the ground. And then the, and, and like, it was horrible. And I basically was like not comfortable with the stunt and ended up not even, not even uh, uh, doing the film. Okay. So I never, I never actually worked on the film because like I was telling you before we started this, I'm not a stunt man, I'm an actor. And I just happened to get in the door and thought, oh, this is gonna be amazing. Not realizing the, or being told what this stunt actually was. I just matched the guy. So I wasn't comfortable with, with that work. So I never, I never did the movie. Okay. It's still, it's still on your IMDb page. Yeah. So curious. yeah. And then, it, no, and, then no. it, and then, and then it wasn't mentioned exactly what it was. So that's why I kind of picked it out because I wasn't. Yeah. Sure. 
Yeah, it wasn't something I ever did. And they, they put that in there because I was on the list to be in it. But I never ended up working a day just rehearsing. So I won't blame poor research on that. I'll just blame it's IMD. No, 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 yeah, it's on there. People ask me about that, and I'm like, oh, that's I was never even on there. <laughs> does, does that happen a lot in the movie world? We'll say if you get called to do something and you're not exactly sure what it's going to be. Say if you get a last minute call, like you said, what maybe happened when you had to replace Ken when he couldn't do it for different roles like that, even for extra roles or non-speaking roles. Could you just show up? somewhere and not know exactly what's going to be going on no that's a very unique thing especially okay. in the stunt, stunt world like yeah. in the stunt yeah. world they will never hire somebody unless they know your abilities especially something like that the only reason that slipped through the cracks is the stunt coordinator was uh from the uk so he didn't know people from here and somebody had worked with me and just referred my name because i matched and he's like oh you're perfect so he just assumed since he's not from here that I was like a stunt guy that knew what I was doing, but I wasn't. If it was yeah. a guy, if it was an American that was hiring, he would have never hired me. It would have been like, I don't know this guy. Like, like we're doing crazy wire work. I can't because it's a safety thing. It's a safety thing. If they throw somebody in there and that guy gets hurt or dies, you know, then, then it's on them. So it just happened to fall through the cracks. Cause this guy was from the UK and didn't know the American stuntman and figured if anybody's coming to meet him, then they're a full blown stunt guy. So that's how yeah. that happened. Yeah. In, in terms of the, the acting side of things, then, um, what have you got coming up in, in those lanes? Any projects that you can fill the fans in on? Yeah. So there's a really uh, fun project that I, I filmed a, a month or so ago called, uh, never hike alone Two. And for those of you who are fans of Friday the 13th, Never Hike Alone um, out, is out right now. And it's a fan film made by Vincent DeSante, who is a filmmaker. So it's a fan film, but done on the level of a professional production. Because I've seen most fan, a lot of fan films, and although they've gotten better, they're pretty bad. And the acting is bad. But this guy is a huge Friday the 13th fan and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to make, there's a lack of Friday the 13th. They've been in a battle, a legal battle. He yeah. hasn't come out since 2009. I'm going to make my own. And he put this thing out there and it, it was amazing. And it gained so much traction. Now he just, he's finishing part two and I play a sheriff in that. They bring back several of the old cast, um, Tommy Jarvis from, four or five tom matthews and me and um that's gonna launch this october it's coming out this october and it's freaking high quality and people are actually saying it's better than 2009 because it's done by a real fan doing it mm -hmm. so so that's something to look out for obviously my film um and um i got several other projects that that I'm attached to that I'm going to be shooting. Um, can't shoot right now because of the strike. So they're yeah. kind of on a, on a hold right now. Um, so um, that's one of the reasons why I was available now because I, I'm not <laughs> shooting stuff. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, uh, I, I have some stuff I'm doing. I'm always doing stuff, something, you know. And the, the strike is, uh, it's a very, very serious thing over there isn't it and like it's not going to go away anytime soon no the strike is serious because basically with uh, netflix and the streaming we used to make the thing is with an actor i'm very fortunate that i've been able to work consistently but i'm i'm like um part of like a f less than five percent of people that make a living in hollywood which is crazy to to, to people don't realize that is that the movie stars you're seeing, they make ridiculous amounts of money, but I'm talking about people that are less known. Um, they don't make a lot of money. So the way the residual system is based was in the past with DVDs and VHS before that and cable was if, so, if an actor books a gig, which is very hard to do, he may only book one thing a year 
that actor will be able to live off that money for months and months, right? Now, when streaming came, they changed that, where it's like you get paid for the work, which is a good check for the for the day or whatever. After that, you get five cents. So for an actor to survive nowadays, it's it's almost impossible unless you have some sort of a, a name or, or whatever, you have to have a side job. So what we're saying now is like these companies are making billions of dollars and not sharing any of that wealth because we haven't figured out how they know they're not giving us how much you know, all the stuff that they're making behind the scenes. So for instance, something like Netflix pay a, a subscription and then they could, anyone could see it at any time and we don't get any money off that. And people are downloading it. I mean, watching it over and over. So we're trying to figure out a way where we can also be compensated and spread a little of that, that wealth. Um, so that's the issue. If it continues, yeah. and then it's also the AI stuff, like paying somebody a one-time fee and then using their likeness forever. There's like, that's just, that's like insane. Like then, then what happens to us? We're done, you know? So, so those are the things that we have to fight for. And if we don't fight for them, we'll never be able to make a decent amount of money in this business. I feel like that you guys are going through what, musicians kind of went through when with the, that yeah. stuff that, that stuff that napster and metallica were talking about that and yeah. everyone was getting on their backs back then and they were right all along they if were you look right at all along they were a hundred percent right and since people didn't understand at the time they were giving metallica a lot of heat like oh you fucking rich you know but it wasn't it was like they saw that this couldn't be the death of musicians you know because this is a new thing and um and you know now we have apple music and all these things that are, are helping but still like they're not musicians don't make their money off that they make their money off concerts now whereas before yeah. cds and records and stuff they used to make millions and millions off that's gone it's it's all about the concerts it's all about the concerts now whereas where I'm at, like, I'll make good money when I work, but where I'm making my residuals is like these conventions, basically. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. kind of like that concert for a, a musician, you know? Yeah. But they're not, they're not compar com comparable in the sense that, you know, like if Metallica do a concert for oh, 80,000 yeah. people tonight, yeah. you know, and then you guys are going to a con and you have no idea how many people are going to show up because that's kind of out of your control. Yeah. So, like, I just, I, I don't see where the, where the end game is going to be with it. I just hope it goes the right way or we could be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. It's kind of scary, you know, like to think about, but you know, I try to focus on what I can control and, uh, yeah. you know, developing my own projects you know, just improving as an artist, getting my name out there more. I mean, that's all I could really control. So it's unfortunate, but it's uh, it's just the way it is. And we got to move forward and hope for the best and hopefully um, get a get a decent, fair contract out of this. Yeah, and I hope it's so. Not about, it's not about us screwing, other, screwing them over or, you know, I've, I've seen people say, oh, you actors, you, you know, you're greedy. And it's like, it's not about any of that. It's, no. it's about if sharing you, if, profit. If you look at, if you look at pay scale, I'm only going to use the guy in his example, but like the amount of money will say that Dwayne Johnson is getting for all his movies, the same oh. as Arnold Schwarzenegger was back in wherever, like back it's in at day, a different yeah. level now. Yeah. But um, that's the point that you guys are making, like just to, spread yeah, out the exactly, the stuff exactly. Like, and that, and that makes and I, sense. I, and I understand how the the lead you know and the name gets more than the others but it's you know you know bob Iger is the example the head of disney the ceo i mean there's a breakdown of the amount of millions and millions that guy's making and it's like the people that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting are not even making even a quarter of that. So is that fair? I mean, let's, let's spread this out a little bit, make it a little more fair among others that are doing 
just as much work, you know? So yeah, that's where yeah. we're at with that. 100% agree. <laughs> Look, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of got a little bit sidetracked there, but anyway, yeah. anyway Doug, if people want to keep in contact with your appearances, conventions, what's going on in your life, where's the best place to catch you up? Uh, the, the three main ones I use are my Facebook fan page. That's uh, Douglas Tate, T-A-I-T. Um, there's uh, Instagram, actor Douglas Tate. TikTok, actor Douglas Tate. Those are uh, those are the ones I use. Yeah. yeah. And look, yeah. it's a uh, pleasure to catch up with you today, man. Yeah, you too. Hold on. my uh, I just got a call. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. too, buddy. Good talking to you. I hope. Maybe it's an important call. So look, I'll let you take your call, man. And I'll be in contact. Maybe when the movie is about to distribute, yes. we might do this again and we'll talk about it when we get a date over here in Sounds Ireland, the good. UK. Might do a little yes. bit of promo. That'd be great, man. And hey, if anybody's out there listening um, and you want to take a trip to Manchester, I will be there in November 13th at the For the Love of Horror. Best convention in Europe. Definitely go, guys. Thanks a million, Doug. Thank you, bud.